the old evangelist Vance Havner said this, We have left our love for Christ, and when love for Christ dies, love for each other, for the Bible, for souls, dies. So love for Christ leads to love for others. And this is described in 1 John chapter 3. So if you'll turn your Bibles, please, to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 10. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 10. No, please, it's First John, that's near the end of the Bible, not just plain John, which is close to the middle. So First John chapter 3, and uh, starting verse 10. The Bible says, By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Now, it is interesting, if you're going to describe the children of God, sometimes it also helps to describe what they're not like, or in this case, the children of the devil. So let's look uh, first at what he describes the children of the devil. They do not practice righteousness, verse 10 says. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, the idea of practicing righteousness does not mean you have to be perfect. And so we're all aware that it's not us. So what does it mean when it says not practicing righteousness? Well, there are a couple of ideas. One is that the main flow of your life, the main move of your life, the, the, the primary concern of your life, if you are a child of the devil, has nothing to do with God. Maybe you're just kind of how it defines your life. But in to say practicing, but he uses this particular term, righteousness. The idea of righteousness means to match someone's standard. Now, basically, what you hear so often is, man, be your own person. Do your thing. You do you. Don't be constrained. Don't let the man get you down. All this kind of stuff. Like, you know, bring it. Do your, listen, I want people to follow someone's standards. I want them to stop when that light is red if I'm going through the intersection on the green. I don't want them to decide to do their own thing. I want them to follow a standard. I do not want to walk into a building where someone says, well, how, how, how large does that wall need to be? I don't know. Just however it feels to you. Whatever foot feels like to you, then you just, you go with your, I want them to follow a standard before I walk in that building. I mean, it starts from early in life. You don't just kind of roll into school when you feel like it. Being your own self, there's a start time and a finish time. And we are to spell words the same way. So we have spelling tests. Now I'll go back again. We realize that no one is perfect. But how in the world can we communicate? If you just did your own thing with language, just arrange words the way you wanted to, pronounce them the way you want to, just stick them together in your it would be impossible to communicate. To communicate, we need some kind of standard. I mean, all of life is full of standards that someone else has put on us for life to work right, and we're thankful for that. I mean, we like some moral standards. We like when people put on some clothes. And I'm just going to say right here, some folks need to put on some more clothes. And I'm not saying because somehow they're seductive, they just need to cover up. Oh, please. I mean, just like, and so what? We, we, we need a, there's some standards. Well, the same is true in spiritual life. God sets the standards. So what the world says is we'll set our own standards. So they don't want to practice God's standards. They want to practice God's righteousness. They're just going to run and do their own thing. But not only do they not practice righteousness, but notice it says, the end of verse 10, that they do not love the brothers. They don't love other people. Now, this makes sense to me. If there is no God, why in the world would I care about you? You're just a lump of something. i got one life, and I'm going to make the most of it. In fact, my life might be better if some of you weren't here. <laughs> That's the world's mentality. 
that life doesn't matter. But his life is not created in the image of God. And so, why bother loving someone unless it is better for me? And if it's better for me, then okay, I can do it. So they, they don't practice God's righteousness and they don't love one another. And so now he's going to give us an illustration of what this looks like. Down in verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who is the evil one and murdered his brother. Now this is a story from early on, so let's start at the beginning. God creates everything. He makes the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, and puts them into a garden and everything is wonderful. Everything's in harmony. Everything is fantastic. And then one day they eat from the no-no tree. So God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. Now, not only is there some animosity between them and God, but there's animosity between each other. So they have a, a child, Cain, and they have another child, Abel. Cain is a farmer. He works the fields, and Abel is a shepherd. He keeps the sheep. And the Bible says in the process of time, they each brought an offering to the Lord. Cain brought an offering from the field. He just went and got any old basket of grain and brought it to God. Abel, on the other hand, says, brought the firstborn of his flock. The offering itself is not important. It is the attitude which is given. Because the Bible says that God had regard for or looked at Cain, I'm sorry, looked at Abel and his offering. But to Cain and his offering, he did not regard, and I respect, did not look. And so Cain becomes angry. Now I'm going to give you sort of the Paul Smith version of what happened. God looked and said, well, just chill out. If you'll make it right, everything will be okay. Because we have a forgiving God. But Cain doesn't want to repent and make it right. Instead, he just harbors anger and resentment towards him. His brother hadn't done anything to him. All his brother did was something that was pleasing to God. And so Cain one day rises up and kills his brother Abel. And then God comes to him and says, Cain, where's your brother? He goes, hmm. I don't want, I'm a visual learner. I've always pictured Cain as just, you know, hmm. Because that's the answer you give when you know you've been caught. Hmm. And this is the way the Bible says, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. And God says, your brother's blood cries from the very ground that you have been uh, sowing and reaping. So, he says, don't be like Cain. Now, why of all the people who could have picked from the Old Testament that committed murder, why did he pick Cain? Because Cain killed his brother. And that's the, the point he wants to drive at is, is, if you do not follow God's standard, even the murder of family members becomes a possibility. Out of jealousy and bitterness, and anger, and so he rose up, and, and so he says, look, if, if because that Cain hated his brother, oh my goodness, think about what non-believers are going to do. Therefore, verse 13, do not be surprised, the world hates you. Now, why does the world hate Christianity? It is not because of what we're in here doing this morning. They couldn't care less what we're doing. That's what's not here. They don't care. It doesn't bother them at all. Let me tell you why Christianity is hated. Because Christianity is not a Sunday morning activity. Christianity is who we are 24-7. That's why our church's purpose statement ends with 24-7. This is who, not what we do, it's who we are all the time. And so they, they don't like the fact that our Christianity goes beyond the walls of the church. Because I can't keep it in here because this isn't where I live. Contrary to the opinion of some children. <laughs> This is not why this is. We live out there and our Christianity doesn't go with us. It is us. I said, just don't be surprised, Cain hated Abel, if the world is going to hate you. They are murderers. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Verse 14, they are living in death. We have, we have passed out of death and life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love lives in death. They are the walking dead. Now, why are they the walking dead? Because of verse 15. They have no eternal life abiding in them. So here's kind of the way that it works. There are two lives and two deaths. If you have one life, you will have two deaths. If you have two lives, you will have one death. Here's what that means. If the only life you have is your physical life, you are dead spiritually, and you're going to die physically. But if you have both physical life and spiritual life, you will only have a physical death. And the great news is that someday Jesus is going to return, and our body will catch up with where our spirit is at. And so, when he says here, when talking about abiding in death, is that they are spiritually dead versus those who are spiritually alive. Now, now listen carefully. 
Eternal life is not what happens when we die. It does not begin when we get to heaven. Eternal life begins when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not going, we're not looking forward to getting eternal life. We rejoice that we have eternal life right now if we have Jesus. So, death permeates, though, them as opposed to life. Now, let me just kind of show you the way this works when we think about death and this God's standards and the world standards and the way it works. I researched the top arguments for abortion. And here they are. Number one, women have a moral right to decide what to do with their body. Number two, the right to abortion is vital for gender equality. Number three, the right to abortion is vital for individual women to achieve their full potential. Number four, banning abortion puts women at risk by forcing them to use illegal abortionists. Not true. Number five, the right to abortion is to be part of a portfolio of pregnancy rights that enables women to make a truly free choice whether to end a pregnancy. Now, there's something glaringly omitted from those top five arguments. And that is, that baby is a life. None of the arguments consider the fact that we have a life. Because you see, if you don't follow God's standards, life is not important. But if you follow God's standards, you recognize that every life is valuable and important. And made in the image of God. And so, it is a, it's a view of the world of death. But I'm glad I'm not a child of the devil. All right, we got four of us. I said, I'm glad I'm not a child of the devil. Instead, he also describes what it's like to be a child of God. Look how he describes it in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We've heard it from the beginning, that, that those who are children of God... We start with God's message. We start with God's Word. Our authority is the Bible. We love one another because God has commanded us to do so in His Word. We believe there's life in Jesus Christ because the Bible describes it. We recognize that we are separated from God because we've broken His commands in the Bible. We stand guilty as proclaimed by the Bible. And our only hope of forgiveness is in the blood, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because this is what the Bible tells us. So we have heard it from the beginning. It's God's Word. And that we should love one another. The world hates, but we love. It is to be the descriptor of a child of God. Now, if you, this just freaks me out. If we're going to love like the Bible says, the world's going to hate us. Why is that? Because it brings conviction. It shows that they don't love the way they should. But this is my favorite statement of all about the children of God in the verse 14. We have passed, look what verse 14, look at verse 14. We know we have passed out death into life. If you don't know Jesus, you are the walking dead. But if you know Jesus Christ, you are the walking living. And some of you dead heads need to be reminded that in Jesus, there is life. And some of you sour pussies need to be reminded that this life brings joy. And if that doesn't do it for you, please leave the rest of us alone. We like being saved. We like being Christians. We like following Jesus. And we even like for our faith to show that we like Jesus. We should live like people that are alive. They're the dead dead. Some of you walk around like the living dead. Oh my goodness, we ought to walk around like the living living. Because we're passed from death into life. And we have everlasting life in Him. Therefore, we love the brothers. He says it again in verse 14. We love the brothers. Now, <clears throat> this love one another is an interesting thing. If you, it, if you love somebody, it just kind of it starts to show. About a, <clears throat> about a month ago now, uh, we were helping our son and his wife move. They just graduated college, and uh, so we were helping move into an apartment. And we swung by a burger place to grab some lunch, and we were, I'm, I'm, we're kind of standing there waiting on our order. And but when you're a preacher, you just can't help but watch people, because there's sermon illustrations everywhere. And so, you know, you're like, you looking at me? Uh, <clears throat> and so, I'm standing there, I see this very elderly couple. Now, y'all know how to define elderly? 
It's someone older than me. So I get 20, that's somebody in their 30s. And I get 60, somebody says, so however it is, you know, all, elderly is always, they've been here longer than me. Right? So however you want to find it, this couple, they've been, they, they, they've been here a long time. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm watching them. And she's just sitting in her chair at the little table. He goes and gets the napkins and the ketchup and the, the straws and all, and then he shuffles back over. And, and by the fact thing, they sat on the same side of the table. Something rather odd. I like to look at my wife when we're eating, so I just sit on the other side of the table. But anyway, they're sitting on the same side of the table, and you know. And I'm gonna say it was just—it was obvious. It was obvious they like each other. May I suggest to you that's always a component of a good marriage. You just tell, you know, they, there was no shirt that says I'm with him, and you know, and I'm with her. They didn't have, they didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to, to just, you could just see that they were in love with each other and had been married and in love for a very long time. It was just obvious without any kind of external declaration. You just, you could just tell. And, and let me say, when you are a follower of Jesus Christ and His love abides in you, it will just show. Here's normally the way people will respond to it. There's something different about you. There is something different. Jesus resides in you. And His love resides in us. And so it just, we don't have to, you don't have to wear the t-shirt. If people will see the difference that Jesus made, they will see His love flowing through you. So beginning now in verse 16, he's going to kind of give a, a brief description of what this will look like. By this we know love, because you can't give something you haven't received. By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us. How do we know what love is like? Because we have experienced the love of Jesus Christ when He died for us. We know love because He laid down His life for us. And so what should we do? We should imitate Jesus Christ and lay down our lives for the brothers. Jesus gave for us, so we should give for others. Jesus loved us, so we should love others. Jesus cared for us, so we should care for others. Jesus was compassionate for us, so we should be compassionate for others. We should live like Jesus lived toward us. Gave His life for us. So, he gives one specific illustration of this. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, it closes his heart. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This one example that he gives us is someone who is without, someone who, who is struggling. Now, understand, our church does a lot for people in need. We do a lot. For, for people, I mean, you know, we obviously take up school supplies for children. We send Christmas presents to kids all around the world for uh, OCC. <clears throat> we help. Most of you don't know how many people we help. Um, there's hardly a day goes by that we don't get requests by people who are in need. And we meet as many of those needs we talk. Now, we don't pay cell phone bills. But we help people who are in need. We maintain a constant food pantry. There are some needs that we are unable to to take care of, so we have connections with and support agencies that can, so we don't actually own like a battered wife clinic ourselves, but we have places we can refer people, um, and we can, and so we help lots and lots and lots and lots of people. We want them to see the love of Jesus Christ. We want them, when we see someone need, it's our responsibility as people who have been loved by Jesus to show them that love. Now, in our church, we also want to make this a very clear connection that we do it because of what Jesus did. So, every other month, our church observes the Lord's Supper or communion. And, you know, we have the trays. And, and, and if you've been here for it, you know, we have the little cups with the juice. And then we have the little uh, styrofoam, uh, the little cracker. Uh, <laughs> and we have the Lord's Supper. Now, why do we have the Lord's Supper? Well, Jesus commanded it. That's enough of a reason. But why did Jesus command it? So we could remember what He has done for us. So the bread, it's just bread, but it represents the body of Jesus Christ. That He who is infinite and eternal came down and became a human being, became one of us, so that He might die physically on a real cross in a real place outside of Jerusalem. So it reminds us of His body. The Jews... 
is to remind us of the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And we recognize that the blood of animals is not enough to completely and fully and absolutely remove the stain of guilt from us. But the blood of Jesus Christ is more than sufficient, more than able to remove every spot, every stain, to cleanse us from all of our guilt, to forgive us completely and make us the children of God. And so we observe the Lord's Supper to remind us of what Jesus Christ has done. There's a couple other things we do when we have the Lord's Supper. We always remember that Jesus said there's going to be a final one because we don't leave Jesus in the tomb at First Baptist Chandler. We always connect with the fact that our Savior rose the third day. And he not only defeated sin at the cross, but he defeated death at the empty tomb. But when we depart on those Sundays, after we observe the Lord's Supper, we also take up an offering. So every time we have the Lord's Supper, we have people stationed at the doors with a plate. And every single dime that you put into that plate goes into our benevolence fund. And every penny of it is spent to help people in need. Does it go for anything else? Just to help people who are in need. In other words, we want to directly connect what Jesus has done for us with our call to do something for others. Jesus came to meet our need. Now we want to meet the needs of others. Jesus has shown us the love of God. Now we want to show them the love of God. We want to make that connection directly. That's why on Sundays with the Lord's Supper, we take up an offering for those who are in need. But as the Bible says, He laid down His life for us. Therefore, we should lay down our life for the brother. I want you to notice that the, the most important thing about loving one another it requires sacrifice. God's love for us was not written in the clouds. It was written in the blood of His Son. And the pen were the nails that stuck Him to the cross. God showed us what love for one another looks like, and it is a love that sacrifices for others. And so, the reason the world can't love like that is because they've never experienced that kind of love. But we have experienced a love that gives it all for someone else. I want to show you a story from Eddie Ogan. It's been told many times. I'll never forget Easter, 1946. I was 14, my little sister O.C. was 12, and my older sister Darlene was 16. We lived at home with our mother, and the four of us knew what it was like to do without many things. My dad had died five years before, leaving mom with seven school children and no money. A month before Easter, 1946, the pastor of our church announced that a special Easter offering would be taken to help a poor family. He asked everyone to save and give sacrificially. When we got home, we talked about what we could do. We decided to buy 50 pounds of potatoes and live on them for a month. This will allow us to save $20 of our grocery money for the offering. And we thought that if we kept our electric lights turned off, off as much as possible, didn't listen to the radio, we'd save money on that month's electric bill. Darlene cleaned as many houses and yards as possible. And my sister Osi and I babysat for everyone we could. For 15 cents, we could buy enough cotton loop to make three potholders to sell for a dollar. We made $20 on potholders. That month was one of the best of our lives. Every day, we counted the money to see how much we had saved. At night, we'd sit in the dark and talk about how the poor family was going to enjoy having the money the church would give them. We had about 80 people in the church. So we figured whatever amount of money we would give, the offering would be at least 20 times that much. After all, every Sunday, the pastor had reminded everyone to save for the sacrificial offering. The day before Easter, Osi and I walked to the grocery store and got the manager to give us three $20 bills and one $10 bill for all of our change. We ran all the way home to show Mom and Darlene. We had never had so much money before. That night, we were so excited we could hardly sleep. We didn't care that we would not have new clothes for Easter. We had $70 for the sacrificial offering. We hardly wait to get to church. On Sunday morning, the rain was pouring and we didn't own an umbrella. The church was more than a mile from our home, but it did not seem to matter how wet we got. Darlene had cardboard in her shoes to fill the holes, and the cardboard came apart and feet got wet. We sat in the church proudly. I heard some teenagers talking about how we didn't have any new clothes. I looked at them in their new clothes, but I felt rich. When the sacrificial offering was taken, we were sitting on the second row from the front. Mom put in the $10 bill. Each of us put in one of the 20. As we walked home after church, we sang all the way. At lunch, Mom had a surprise for us. She had bought a dozen eggs, and we had boiled Easter eggs with our fried potatoes. Late that afternoon, the minister drove up in his car. Mom went to the door, talked with him for a moment, and then came back with an envelope in her hand. 
We asked her what it was, but she didn't say a word. She opened the envelope, and out fell a bunch of money. There were three $20 bills, one $10, and 17 $1 bills. Mom put the money back in the envelope. We didn't talk, just sat and stared at the floor. We had gone from feeling like millionaires to feeling like poor trash. We kids had had such a happy life, we felt sorry for anyone who had not had our mom. A house full of brothers and sisters. We thought it was fun to share silverware and see whether we got the spoon or the fork that night. We had two knives that we passed around to whoever needed them. I knew we didn't have a lot of things that other people had, but I never thought we were poor. That Easter day, I found out we were. The minister brought us the money for the poor family, so we must be poor. I didn't like being poor. I looked at my clothes and worn-out shoes and felt so ashamed. I didn't even want to go back to church. Everyone there probably knew we were poor. I thought about school. I was in the ninth grade at the top of my class. I wondered if the kids at school knew that we were poor. I decided I could quit school since I finished the eighth grade. That was all the law required at the time. We sat in silence for a long time, and then it got dark and we went to bed. All that week, we went to school and came home, and no one talked much. Finally, on Saturday, Mom asked us what we wanted to do with the money. What did poor people do with money? We didn't know. We'd never known we were poor. We didn't want to go to church on Sunday, but Mom said we had to. Although it was a sunny day, we didn't talk much. Mom started to sing, but no one joined her. At church, we had a missionary speaker. He talked about how churches in Africa were made out of uh, sun-dried bricks, but they needed money to buy a roof. He said $100 would put a roof on a church. The pastor said, can we all sacrifice to help these people? We looked at each other and smiled for the first time in a week. Mom reached into her purse and pulled out the envelope. She passed it to Darlene. Darlene gave it to me and I handed it to O.C. And O.C. put it in the offering. When the offering was counted, the minister announced it was a little over $100. The missionary was excited. He had not expected such a large offering from our small church. He said, you must have some rich people in this church. And suddenly it struck us, we had given $87 out of that $100. We were the rich family in the church. Had the missionary said so, from that day on, I've never been poor again. I've always remembered how rich I am because I have Jesus. Listen. Loving one another requires sacrifice, but I'm telling you, it is worth it. Because when you have Jesus Christ, you are richer than anyone who has ever walked this planet. We don't just love by wearing a shirt. We love indeed. It requires sacrifice, but it is worth it. Because Jesus sacrificed it all for us. We are willing to sacrifice for one another. Oh, when the world sees us, May they see people who love, and I mean really love, with a love that is not me before you, a love that is you before me, a love that sacrifices itself for others to show them the love of Jesus Christ.